And so when they asked, I asked them, hey, so you guys get people from all over at your MSA? They're like, yeah. I was like, wow, that's going to be amazing. I'm coming. And so I went to the first meeting of the MSA. And when I went there, there were two guys. Those two guys that put up the flyer and a box of pizza and an empty room. That's all that was there. And I thought maybe I came to the wrong room because there was nothing really, there's no real reason. There's no DJ, there's no party, there's nothing going on. And so I'm about to walk out of there and these guys stop me. They just sat me down, at least have some pizza before you go. And I sit down, I chat with them, we become a little bit friendly and start talking. And one of those friends later on used to give me a ride home. And this friend of mine who I won't name today, eventually even one day we were stuck in traffic, he pulled over at a masjid. He said, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna go pray. He didn't tell me to pray. Because he didn't, he, he, he used to hear me curse, use filthy language, criticize Islam, talk about how the Quran doesn't make any sense. I used to say all of these things. And he used to sit in the car and go, uh huh, uh huh, yep, mm hmm. Nothing. No response, no debate, nothing. And one day we're stuck in traffic on the LIE and he pulls over, takes this exit, stops at some random masjid, little building, old warehouse building, and says, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go inside and pray. And with all of my arguments about being an agnostic or not believing in religion and all of it, something in me said, I need to go too. And I went inside the masjid, it was maghrib. And when I prayed that maghrib, it was the third rak'ah, I still remember. It was the third rak'ah that we joined. But I hadn't prayed in so long, I didn't even know how to pray. So I joined the third rak'ah and when everybody said salam, I said salam with them. I didn't finish the prayer, I didn't know how much it, you know, but it felt really good. And that entire conversation, the rest of that trip, I didn't say anything. I just went back home and started looking up how to pray again. And started, you know, thinking about how do I do this, I need to, that felt really amazing. And I got into this habit of trying to pray and then I didn't know how to pray so I would have him lead the prayer so I could follow along. He's the one who introduced me to the masajid around the Queen's area. This brother is also the person who introduced me to what was going to be my Arabic teacher, what was going to be my Quran teacher. What I'm trying to tell you right now is that had it not been for the MSA, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I find it pretty incredible that I just led a prayer at the MSA National Convention and my journey started with the MSA where I didn't even know how to make salah. I didn't even know. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that the next Norman Ali Khan, the next Yasir Qadi, the next Sheikh Omar Suleiman, the next Hamza Yusuf are in a campus somewhere now questioning God. They're somewhere, in, they're Muslims, they were born in a Muslim family, but their questions haven't been answered. And they're in a campus in, in New York. And they're in a campus in New Jersey and in Wisconsin and in Virginia. They're in all of these places. And they have no connection to any masjid. They have no connection to any scholar. They have no connection to any religious resources whatsoever. They know about, as much about Islam as a non-Muslim would know. And that's not their fault. The only possible human connection they might have to Islam might be another Muslim on campus. Maybe. That might be it. That might be the only human connection they have. I was raised in a way and I was, my thoughts developed in a way that the idea of approaching someone who even has a beard is scary. These people are crazy. They're extreme. And this is before 9-11, by the way. <laughs> These people are crazy. They're extreme. They're scary. They're judgmental. I want nothing to do with them. I want to stay away from them as far as possible. But fellow students I can talk to. We don't realize that the battle for Islam is not happening on a battlefield. The battle for this religion and the struggle of this ummah is not economic in nature. It's not political in nature. It's not military in nature. The real battle of this ummah are those young people that are losing their Islam on college campuses around the United States, Canada, Australia, across Europe, and even in the Muslim world. This is not just the story of what's happening in America, it's happening all over the world. It's happening all over the world. 
What I'm trying to tell you is the struggle that you think you're having happening in the deep, you know, having in the deep south or at the University of Texas at Austin is not just the struggle of some 20, 30, 40 Muslims in the campus. It's the struggle of the entire Ummah. These young people need our support. This is where Islam will, will come, rise again. The greatest thinkers of this Ummah will be the ones that were in the depths of doubt. And they were on the verge of losing their faith. And when they found it again, there was no one who had stronger Iman than they did. These young people are, are the future of this Ummah. And if we don't invest in them, then I don't care how big our masajid get. I don't care how, how fancy our, you know, how much land we can buy, how much institutions we can build. The only institution we need to concern ourselves with is this next generation. That's the only one.